you so much, Brander. And uh, thank you to everyone who's here this morning for taking the time to engage in our conversation today. Uh, this is important work of justice and reconciliation. My name is Larry Plannard, as Brander has mentioned. Um, for 27 years, I practiced law in Abbotsford. Uh, my work initially was in the courtroom, uh, and then it migrated to doing more solicitor's work. Uh, but that work has ended, and now my full-time work is adjudicating claims in the uh, four survivors of abuse at Indian residential schools. So firstly, I thought I will introduce the context of my work by reading some of the words of apology given by Prime Minister Harper back in 2008. Coupled with that, uh, I thought it was appropriate to also read some of the words of apology that was given by the Anglican Church of Canada. Uh, then secondly, I'll speak briefly about the historic settlement agreement that happened in 2007, uh, the Residential School Settlement Agreement. Uh, I'll follow that with a brief introduction of the independent assessment process, and that's the portion of the settlement agreement that constitutes my work. And then finally, uh, I have a, a video uh, that will demonstrate better than I can probably say in words uh, what my work looks like. So, beginning then with the apology by Prime Minister Harper. I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in these schools is a sad chapter in our history. For more than a century, Indian residential schools separated over 150,000 Aboriginal children from their families and communities. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Today we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm, and has no place in our country. However, years before that apology, uh, churches that ran the residential schools were also issuing their own apologies. And this apology was given on behalf of the Anglican Church of Canada by the then primate Michael Piers on August the 6th, 1993. My brothers and sisters, I have listened as you have told your stories of the residential schools. I have heard the voices that have spoken of pain and hurt experienced in the schools and of the scars which endure to this day. I have felt shame and humiliation as I have heard of suffering inflicted by my people and as I think of the part our church played in that suffering. Now, I didn't read this part of the Harper Apology, but uh, the Prime Minister made reference to the historic Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement. So firstly, it allowed for any former students of an Indian Residential School to receive some compensation, called a Common Experience Payment. Secondly, uh, and this is probably something that most of us are most familiar with, the settlement agreement established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC was given a mandate, among other things, of educating Canadians about the truth of what happened at these schools. Thirdly, the settlement set up a new model under which claims for serious wrongs uh, and serious acts that were committed or occurred at the residential schools, um, a process under which those claims could be heard. Uh, and that process is called the Independent Assessment Process. This is the process that I work under. In this process, an independent adjudicator hears the case and decides on the award to be given based on a compensation framework. 
And I think I resonate so well with this work that I'm doing because uh, within the Mennonite Church, and I'm sure within the Anglican Church this is similar, uh, we're quite familiar with what restorative justice is all about. Uh, and so theologically that work resonates well with my own personal values and beliefs. The process is designed to be claimant central, fair and neutral. It is a non-adversarial process. It's not a trial in court. The adjudicator runs the hearing. The adjudicator resolves the claim uh, and awards compensation. So this is my work. This is, I'm an adjudicator in this process. To give a better sense of what a hearing is like, uh, I'm going to now show you a video that was created to help claimants prepare for their hearings. When we take a look at what happened to us during our experience at the residential school, when trauma comes into our life, we tense up. Pretty soon we get to the point when we start hearing the names of the residential school or the names of the people that worked at the school. Again, we tense up and we keep pushing it down. One of the things I had to learn about myself in my own life was the fear of getting in touch with hurt feelings. The fear of allowing that pain to come out and the tears to flow. I know it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so congratulations for taking this step. In order to get rid of a problem, we have to meet the problem. Say hello to it. Get to know it. Get to identify it. Get to know what it's done to us. And from there, then we could talk about it and let it go. Um, I grew up going um, like a nice Anglican kid growing up on Vancouver Island to church camp, Camp Columbia on Thetis Island. And Thetis Island, take a ferry from Shemanus to get there. The first stop that the ferry makes is at the Penelicate First Nation. And so as I was a child, they would busload us up to the ferry, and then we ride on the ferry across to what was then called Cooper Island. And a whole lot of um, folks from that nation would travel on the ferry. And all kinds of racist shit went down on the ferry. White people said things and did things that were appalling. And nobody talked to the nice white kids going to church camp about that. And while we waited at the first stop of the ferry terminal, we were literally in the shadow of the residential school. We left Cooper Island and we traveled to Thetis Island and we sang songs about Jesus. And nobody told us that Jesus and our church and Indian residential schools had anything to do with each other. So that's kind of the first stop on my journey to reconciliation. When I was in my early 20s, I lived in Washington State and I was connected with a whole bunch of different activist communities. And um, some folks that I knew um, from the Tahoma Indian Center were involved with um, a walk in support of Leonard Peltier. Folks know who Leonard Peltier is? He's a uh, Lakota man who is serving time in a US federal institution for a murder that he did not commit during a shootout on the Rosebud Indian Reservation between federal agents and indigenous people. And this was a um, walk cross country, started in Alcatraz in San Francisco and walked all the way to Washington, D.C. 
I joined them in um, Cincinnati and walked kind of the last 500 miles to Washington, D.C. And there had an experience of full immersion in kind of pan-Indian First Nations culture. And kind of the biggest physical remembrance of that for me was at the end of incredibly hot days where we walked upwards of 20 miles on Highway 50 most of the way. At the end of that walk, when all you wanted to do was to sit down on the grass, instead we stood in a circle and everybody in that circle told us who their grandfathers were and who their grandmothers were and what nation they came from, and I was utterly bewildered. Because that's not the way my culture and my people say who we are and where we come from. And immediately from that circle, we would feed ancestors and elders and all of the hot shot young activists who walked all day in the sun kept standing there and waiting. That was an amazing and powerful, um, not indoctrination, but just inclusion in the values and disciplines of that culture. I'm a member in Vancouver of a little interfaith collective that um, from time to time puts on education events. We in, um, let's see, it's a good five years ago now, put on an event called Ignite the Light. And we invited, and we were really careful about who we invited and how we issued the invitation so that we didn't end up in a situation where it was only indigenous people and only church people talking about reconciliation or a situation where it was all sort of monoculture. We put on a youth-led event that was about generational and intergenerational responses to Indian residential schools, where we sort of said, okay, one-third of our participants are going to be white settlers. One-third will be indigenous people, and one-third will be um, recent immigrant communities, people of color. And each of those communities will be invited to, to tell stories and give responses and draw connections between experiences of oppression and experiences of resistance and liberation. To talk about what it means to be part of a culture that has benefited immeasurably. Because one of the things about residential schools is it's not isolated. It wasn't the only thing that was going on. And we, we often talk about it like it was. So to talk about the, the land extraction that was happening at the same time, to talk about how people who have had different experiences of genocide because the residential school experience, the removal of children from one group, placing them with another group, meets the United Nations definition of genocide how people who have experienced genocide in other places can either be allies or can say, okay, I'm here now, I don't have to worry and think about that. The, the ways that this work has impacted my faith are, are many and myriad. And the, the least expected was that um, in my activist work, I've done, you know, stare down riot cops. I spent a week in LA County Jail. But until I was involved with the reconciliation circles and the, the church, was churches listening to survivors area at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I was not convinced that you needed prayer to do the work. And as a white person, as a church person, as a kind of visual and physical representative of somebody who has benefited time and again from the systems 
that it made residential schools. From the actual activities, from the land loss that were connected with that, to go into a space with indigenous partners and say, we want to create a space to hear survivors. I was completely unable to do that without faith, without prayer. And so that, maybe for me, has been the biggest way that this work has impacted my faith. And I think for now I'm going to stop with that. I'm better with the question and answer than I am with the just talking off the top of my head. So thank you. Some people because he wasn't able to go back and this kind of thing and uh, 
So I gave my cell phone and he made a phone call back there and, and I realized that Archie had been a student at St. Michael's Residential School. Exactly where I was. Here I was living my, my life as I was and here he was in that place. Well, in these last years, I've been learning quite a bit about the Indian Residential School story that I didn't know, and most of us white Canadians didn't know, and uh, got involved and was very involved there, really appreciated. It was quite an honor to be sitting together with uh, Chief Bobby Joseph and his daughters and with uh, um, a number of other Indigenous leaders and, and other church leaders and all uh, for one purpose, one cause, working together. Uh, and the really cool part that arose out of that was when this church, the Church is Listening to Survivors area was developed uh, at, the, at the TRC, uh, that, that uh, these folks who, who were across denominations, Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks working together for all these, you know, several years, getting together regularly. Now when it came to working together at this place, there was a seamless involvement. There, there was no denominational acknowledgement of who was from where or what. We were just, you know, if there was some need that happened, I mean, Laurel was the first one to jump up and run and help, and many others were the same. And just, just all, if we needed to pray, if we needed to go help somebody, it was, there was just like no boundaries, nothing dividing all these different denominational groups. That, because we've been working together, we had a common cause and interest, and it was now being expressed in a very beautiful way by being able to work together uh, like that.
you're above us, and uh, we just ask that we would be found to be faithful, that we would continue to take courage, uh, to build relationships with neighbors around us who, who we don't know, and as, as we continue to uh, see our uh, relationships with our indigenous brothers and sisters grow, uh, that, that we would be good learners and good, uh, good listeners and good people in the conversation to just develop these uh, love relationships that uh, uh, will just uh, make this place a better place and that we find that as we live and eat and uh, dance and be together uh, that this place will be a better place. And we uh, ask you, Lord, to be our guide and to be with us as we go from this place. Uh, thank you for each who has come. Um, encourage us and make us an encouragement to 